Good morning and welcome this morning. I invite you all to join me in our call to worship. Friends in Christ, what hopes do you bring to worship? We bring hope for health and wholeness. What afflictions do you bring to worship? Physical pain from illness and injury. Emotional pain from sad and scary life situations. Mental pain from disease of many kinds. With all these afflictions, it's a miracle that any of us made it to worship this morning. But where else would we be? We yearn to know God's powerful love and to know that wholeness is possible. In today's gospel, a person with an afflicting spirit interrupts Jesus. And Jesus sets the person free. And where does the miracle of this story and our stories begin? when we bring all of who we are, hopeful, afflicted, bold, into the relationship with the divine. So come, let us enter this time of worship with our whole selves. Hopeful, afflicted, and bold. Come, let us worship. Please join me in our opening prayer. Open our hearts and spirits this day to hear the great good news of your power and presence with all your people. Fill our hearts with rejoicing as the words are proclaimed in song and story. Enliven us and remind us that you are with us through the pillar of fire, through the magnificent words of the prophets, through the ministry and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. We now join our voices together in the prayer of confession. We think we know so much, O oh God, and with our meager knowledge, we presume to judge others. We arrogantly announce our own righteousness without a compassionate thought. We proclaim your word when it suits us and often only to, to those with whom we want to associate. We shut others out of our faulty judgment and our blindness. There have been so many times in which our humble help would have been a blessing to someone but we have placed our comforts before serving others. In the competing voices of today's world, we have turned around and around, trying to find the way to live. Help us, merciful God, to tr again listen to you. Help us to truly open our hearts to you. Remind us again of your great love and presence in our lives. Forgive our foolishness and stubbornness. Create in us new spirits filled with your love, offering peace and hope to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Quiet your hearts, beloved of God, for God is speaking to you with love. Rest your spirit, struggling one, for God will surround you with peace. Open your lives to God's power and presence, and do not be afraid. God is with us, now and for all time. Amen. We come now and we lift up our joys and concerns. What have we done, Lord? We want to praise you, so we splash your words on screens on a wall with brightly colored and powerful images. We shout your praises, praises with hands held high. We teach and preach your word, but we don't listen carefully for you. We are so busy trying to shout out the noise of the day that we don't take time to really listen and know you. The voices of the prophets spoke to people long ago who were too busy and anxious to hear. Their words streamed in the mind, winds of the time and have come to us. We need to pay attention to your message offered through them. You are our God, the God of all creation, the God of power and love whose mercy is offered to us. In Jesus' time, you proclaim the good news through words and actions, reaching out to those who were troubled, alienated, cast aside. He offered healing and hope to those to others turned away. 
help us to learn that you alone can heal us and fix those areas in our lives that are wounded and twisted. Help us to understand that you alone can offer us a new way of life through Jesus Christ. Let us take a moment of silence and speak the names of people and situations that concern us, praying for your healing touch, that the same touch is offered to us in Jesus' name. Lord, we need to let go of our control issues and place our trust wholly in you, now and forever. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise you up for a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of my Lord any more, or ever see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet from, like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall speak my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in my name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. And our scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel attributed to Mark, Verse one, chapter one, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the syna Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not just as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you done with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. It was Sabbath, and so naturally, the Jews of Capernaum went to synagogue. Some of them went sleepily. Others went with great weariness following a busy week of work. Still others trekked over in rather irritable mood, for who knows why. Maybe it was no more than they were out of cream cheese back of the house, and the bagel at breakfast that morning just wasn't as good without it. In any mood, something set them off, and they weren't in the best of the moods as they approached synagogue. Still others arrived having bickered with their kids on the way over. We're going to God's house for pity's sake, shape up kids. It was Sabbath, and so naturally they went to synagogue. From various paths emerging from a variety of experiences in the weeks gone by, awash in a mix of differing emotions and mental states they came. 
They came because, among other things, it was frankly their pious habit to do so. For as long as many of them could remember, they had gone to synagogue on Sabbath morning. It was the thing to do. It was what was expected of you. You went to synagogue. You moved your way through the fairly stead and predictable liturgy, listened as the scribes read a portion of the Torah, sang a halal doxology, and then you went home for the feast day meal at noon. It was the Sabbath, and so naturally they went to synagogue. But on that particular morning, Jesus of Nazareth was there, and his presence could create a worship service no one would ever forget. This Jesus stood up as some kind of guest pastor. Few, if any, had ever heard of him before. And once they looked in the bulletin and saw he was from Nazareth originally, not a few perhaps groaned inwardly. But then he started to teach. And although he was no John the Baptist, full of theatrics and arm-waving fire and brimstone rhetoric, there was something striking in the very way Jesus spoke. It wasn't that his ideas and vocabulary were fresh and innovative, and it wasn't simply that he was a better orator than they had at first guessed. Rather, there was something in the very presence in the man that made you want to sit up straighter. Even the teenagers who had worked so hard at perfecting a bored, stiff look on their faces couldn't help perking up, slouching a bit less, and listening more closely than they cared to admit. This man had authority. He had a moral gravity, a weightiness and substance to him that people found difficult to explain. Somehow they sensed that this man and the message about God's kingdom he was talking about were one and the same thing. This man's impact had nothing to do with any seminary diplomas he had hanging on the wall. It did not stem from his once having been ordained, and it wasn't just because he was able to preach without any distracting stutters. No, this man was the very message he was proclaiming. They couldn't quite put their finger on it, but this man packed a wallop just by virtue of being there at all. A few folks were starting to whisper at their amazement, even as other folks crawled a furtive wow on the bulletin and then showed it to the person next to them. They were just starting to realize that something extraordinary was happening when suddenly from the back pew, a shriek went up. Wah! People's blood ran cold. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to wipe us out already? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Edward Marquardt writes, I would like to begin by telling you a modern parable. It's a favorite story. A number of years ago, we moved to Seattle, Washington, and we bought a house. This house was a ca catastrophic mess. The foundation of the house had sunk. The floors had sunk four to five inches. The big picture windows in the living room were cracked. The plasterboard of the walls was cracked. This house was one glorious, ugly, nasty disaster. Well, it was not only the inside of the house that was a catastrophic disaster, so it was the outside. All around our house, it was a living disaster. Let me explain. On all sides of our house, to the east, south, west, and north, blackberry bushes were sprawling in every direction. Blackberry bushes. Yes, you heard right. These were lovely, voluptuous, full-growing, large-stemmed blackberry bushes. And those blackberry bushes had grow been growing there for years, perhaps decades. If you are a person who loves blackberry pie or blackberry wine or blackberry cider, our house was the house to buy. We had blackberries to feed all of the neighborhood, the church, if not the city of Des Moines and the whole world beyond. So after moving into their house, I made a decision. I declared war on the blackberry bushes. Yes, I said war. 
I said to myself out loud, I have come to destroy you. To begin my war with the blackberry bushes, I need a little, needed a little help on how to get rid of these luscious, lushly growing vines. I went to the resident gardener in the congregation, who was an old Norwegian by the name of Al Lundy. He was one smart old coot, old Mel Lundy was. Lundy was like an old horse doctor, part-time veterinarian, part-time plumber, part-time election, electrician, who had his personal remedies for fixing everything. Old man Lundy knew about gardening, mother nature and blackberry bushes. Old man Lundy said, so you wanna get rid of all the blackberry bushes? What you do is you go out there in the middle of the winter, in the very middle of the annual big freeze and cut them suckers off as low as you can to the ground. That made sense. So I waited until February and the big freeze came. It was cold freezing, really cold for Seattle, Washington. And I went out that morning with my Sith, which I had to borrow from old man Lundy, freezing my little tootsies and I cut them all down. I then did a pastoral thing. That is, I prayed for the Lord to continue the big freeze for a few days. Then that cold freezing air would get down to the roots and kill the blackberry bushes. I cut them all down, raked up the bushes into a pile and waited to burn them and waited for spring. I turned my back on them. And a few months later, I looked and all the blackberry bushes were crawling all over the yard, crawling all over the bank crawling all over the yard, north, south, east, and west. What was I going to do? What was I going to do? The war was still on and the blackberry bushes had won the first battle. So I approached my elderly neighbor by the name of Al, Al Powell, who was a retired Boeing engineer and a great gardener. I said to Al, I got this problem with my blackberry bushes. What am I going to do to actually get rid of them? He said, Amitrol. Amitrol will do in, the, do in the blackberry bushes every time. Lots of it. I bought gallons of Amitrol and began to spray them the next spring when they were just leafing out. I sprayed them from top to bottom, backwards and forwards, inside and out, again and again. I sprayed them relentlessly. Those blackberry bushes shriveled up and got nice and brown. I cut the brown brambles off and burned them. I felt so momentously proud. I turned my back for a few months and lo and behold, those blackberry bushes were all back laughing and smiling at me. And all those blackberry bushes wanting to grow berries to be pies and wines and cobblers. What should I do? The blackberry bushes won the second battle. So I telephoned people at the University of Washington. I asked for the Blackberry Warfare Department. A professor of horticulture said to me, you have to go after their roots. Those roots after all these years of growth are down deep. You have to dig them up, way down into the roots, one root at a time. You have to dig out all the roots, one at a time. For one week I dug, another week, week after week, month after month. I dug those bank banks with blackberry bushes with a big pick and iron bar with sweat and tears and grumbling. I dug down until I found a knotty root ball way down deep in the ground. It was the worst job of my life. I found an enormous root system, big roots, big knotty root balls, miles of them, so it seemed. I dug and dug, I turned my back on them for a period of time. When I looked back, they were there again, but considerably smaller. They were little ones. I pulled out these little sprigs. I planted my lawn. I planted my garden. I planted my tan junipers, rhododendron, azaleas, and my ivy so these plants would take over my yard in the bank. These plants started to grow and grow. After about 10 years, the battle was won. I had destroyed the blackberry bushes in my yard. I had won the battle with the blackberry bushes. What I found out at that time is the land is either going to be occupied by a good lawn and a good rhododendrons and azaleas and tam junipers and ivy, or it was going to be occupied by the blackberry bushes. It was either or, either the blackberry bushes or the good plants. 
you see the land never remained neutral. Either land was ruled by weeds or it was ruled by beautiful plantings. It never remained neutral. It never remained neutral, never. The land is always ruled by which is good or the land is ruled by that which is ev evil. It is always either or. Well, by now you have figured out the parable, I am sure. The parable has become a deeply ingrained metaphor on how he understands life. The blackberry bushes represent the power of evil which exists in our world. The power of evil, like the blackberry bushes, is constantly growing. It is constantly coming at you, even when it is underground. The blackberry bushes are never neutral. You cannot turn your back on them. They are either growing at you or you are coming at them. It is either one or the other. I have noticed that you cannot turn your back on the power of evil, which is growing in your life either. About the time you think that you have defeated the power of evil in your own personal life, that power of evil spurts up again within you. About the time that you think you have your little personal demons, they spurt up again. Whether it be drugs, alcohol, jealousies, family conflicts, temper tantrums, little materialisms, sexual fantasies, or whatever the demons in your life, those demons hanker after you and come at you again and again and again. Life and demons attacks never cease. About the time you think that you have your demons under control, they come back in all their glory. And I have discovered the more power of evil is rooted in your life, the more power of evil is rooted in our culture. It is more difficult to exterminate. I would like to suggest to you this morning that our society is becoming increasingly a demon-possessed society that our society is becoming increasingly possessed by the power of evil. The blackberry bushes are really growing and thriving in our culture. Now, by demon possession, I am not talking about the Mickey Mouse stuff like the old movies, The Exorcist, with people foaming at their mouths, with sofas and chairs floating around the air, or levitating with knife and forks floating in the air. I am not talking about that imaginary kid stuff that is made for movies, I am talking about the real stuff. Real stuff, real demon possession, is when the power of evil possesses a culture and an individual lives in that culture. For example, German, Germany during World War II was a demon-possessed evil culture. It wasn't simply Hitler who was demon-possessed, but the whole nation or enough segments of that whole nation became demon possessed by the power of evil. Otherwise, how could six million Jews be exterminated in the name of goodness? How could that thing happen if a culture had not become evil? When good people do nothing and try not to know about the evil thing that is going on around them. Real demon possession was the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia years ago. Three million out of seven million Cambodians were exterminated in one year. All those teachers lined up one after another and they shot them all dead. This was one of the most awful things that has ever happened in human history. There was a demon possessed culture. It simply wasn't Pol Pot who was demon possessed. It was that culture which allowed that kind of evil to perpetuate itself. Real demon possession Think of Bosnia. At one time, it was a demon-possessed land. Real demon possession. Think of the Hutus and Tutsis in Central Africa. As we witness the butchery in that culture, we know that it was a demon-possessed land. Think of all the people who allowed that kind of evil to perpetuate it. What I'm suggesting to you is that our culture here in America is very much like the blackberry bushes in Edward Marquardt's backyard some years ago. Those blackberry bushes are rampaging, running wild, and ours is increasingly a demon-possessed society. Let me give you several examples because I think some of you maybe think I'm exaggerating. You know, we can be numb to evil violence within our society and pretend that it doesn't hurt anymore. 
let me give you indications of a rapidly accelerating demon possessed within our evil society. Have you looked at the FBI reports lately on violent crimes, assaults, rapes, and muggings? Have you looked at those statistics, which seemed quite level in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s? Focus on the 70s. That chart in the 70s goes straight up. Those violent crimes go straight up like a bull market. An evil spirit showed up at the synagogue. Well, this didn't happen every week in worship either. Be quiet, Jesus commanded it. And everyone was glad he said it because it was on the tip of their tongues too. You can't tolerate this kind of thing in church. The only thing for such an interruption is to tell the person to hush and then hope the ushers get over there fast to bring this sadly crazed person to the narthex. Everyone in the synagogue was thinking, be quiet. And so they were so glad that Jesus said it out loud on their mutual behalf. But then Jesus said something that no one else had in mind. Come out of him. And no sooner were those words out of Jesus' mouth than the man convulsed. He shook like a leaf in a violent wind before shrieking one last time and then collapsing in a heap. But then this hapless fellow was better. The fire had gone out of his eyes and a look of calm came over him. At that precise, precise moment, however, he was the only calm looking one in the whole place. Everyone else was scraping their jaws off the floor. This just didn't happen every week at church. By that late in the service on a typical Sabbath, people's thoughts were usually beginning to drift to other vital things, like will they get home on time enough to keep the pot roast from drying out, and is little Charlie behaving himself in church today? But not today. No one's mind wandered. No one turned his or her thoughts to the mundane or the typical. They had encountered Jesus, and he was all they could talk about for a long time to come. It was Sabbath, and so naturally they went to synagogue. But on that particular day, by that time, they returned home from the synagogue. The people had an overwhelming sense they had been in the very presence of God in a way that was anything but typical. But then, what did they know was that the very Son of God would be present that day too. The thing is, however, that we Christians go to church every week, and we do know that the Son of God will be present via the Holy Spirit. But do we expect that this living presence of Almighty God will shake us up, make us exclaim over the power in our midst? We shouldn't need to see this razzle-dazzle that the people of Capernaum saw that day, nevertheless, to know that we have encountered something wonderful. Maybe we should even expect to see it. Because when you gather for worship and Jesus is truly there, anything can happen, but something life-giving will happen every time. We should expect no less. Amen. Thank you.
and the goodness of God, go forth. Go and laugh with your friends. Reconcile with those who have hurt you. Be kind to the strangers and feel the divine smile upon us, now and forevermore. Amen. It was good to see you this week and I hope to see you again next week. Thank you.